Happy New Year. <clears throat> Today we are resuming <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel study in the first week of 2018. It just happened that uh, the passage is about marriage and divorce. I don't think uh, it's just by accident, but by providence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your amazing grace, your faithful love to all of us. This morning we are here to listen, to listen to your word. Lord, please speak. Speak to all of us. Use me as your instrument. Lord, please bring healing and restoration to our families and marriages and to this nation, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Disney fairy tales always end like this. They married a dream prince or dream princess, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> How realistic is this ending? How many of you have a perfect fairy tale, happily, lived happily ever after marriage? Wow. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> like a very Disney tale. <laughs> you know, but uh, Disney fairy tales don't talk about the reality of marriage, like real struggles fighting or divorce. In fact, almost 50% of all marriages in the United States end in divorce or separation. This said. So, Many families are dysfunctional. Is this because they married the wrong persons? In our day, many are confused about marriage and family, seeing marriage in terms of personal fulfillment. In today's passage, Jesus, our Savior and King, teaches about marriage and divorce. What is the meaning of marriage? From Jesus, we learn about a kingdom-centered perspective that can radically transform our lives in family and ministry. In a marriage, in Jesus, marriage is a reflection of the kingdom of God. It is designed to reflect our ultimate love relationship and union with our Lord. My prayer is that God may give us this kingdom vision and restore our marriages and families. As Matthew chapter 19 opens, Jesus finished his ministry in Galilee and was going into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. He was on his way to Jerusalem where he would be rejected, killed on the cross, and be raised from the dead. Large crowds followed him because they saw the signs of the kingdom in Jesus. Jesus healed them and restored them. In Jesus, the Messiah, the kingdom of heaven is advancing, even today now. In chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught about the humility and the importance of forgiveness for the citizens of the kingdom. In Matthew 19.3, Matthew introduce, introduces the topic of divorce. To study this topic, we will have to keep in mind Jesus' grace of humility and forgiveness. Look at verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? 
This question was a sneaky test. Divorce was a hot button issue that can become easily political and polarizing people. You know, uh, John the Baptist, when he challenged uh, Herod Antipas to repent of his adultery and divorce, it cost him his life. Now, when some Pharisees tested Jesus with evil intent, Satan was at work to destroy the work of the Messiah. How did Jesus respond to their question? Look at verses 4 through 6. We can read uh, together. Okay, let's go. Haven't you read the reply? That at the beginning of the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. And the two will become own flesh. So they are no longer two. Thank you. Jesus revealed that the people began at a false starting point by asking when divorce is permissible. But led by the scriptures, Jesus redirected their question by asking, haven't you read? When questioned about divorce, Jesus appealed to the original meaning of marriage in creation. Why? Why? It's because the original purpose of marriage in creation is being fulfilled through Jesus the Messiah. With Jesus, the kingdom of God is coming to redeem our broken relationships, including marriage. So, what are some uh, critical, important uh, aspects of marriage that Jesus fulfills and emphasizes? Number one, marriage is God's design, not man's. God's design. Jesus said, at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, referring to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God made mankind in his own image. Both man and woman were made in the image of God. We have a tendency to think of marriage in terms of our personal happiness, asking, how can it fulfill my desire and make me happy? But marriage is not primarily about us, but about God and his image. Most importantly, God's image is love, as revealed through Jesus Christ. God is profoundly relational and unselfishly loving. Marriage is to represent this image of God. Jesus wants us to remember that marriage is designed and established by God. Number two, marriage is a covenant relationship in one flesh union. In the quote from Genesis 2.24, Jesus said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Three verbs describe the covenant character of marriage. To leave, to be united, and to become. To leave implies a deliberate and a permanent departure. A man leaves behind his parents for a spouse, and a wife leaves her parents for a spouse. So now they transfer their primary loyalty from their parents to their spouse. So their human priority is who? Their spouses, yeah, not their children or parents. To be united means to cling on, to stick together, to glue together. This word is often used in a covenant relationship with God. To be united implies to be bonded to someone through a binding promise. 
A man and woman are glued together by a marriage covenant that acts like a most powerful super glue. And God is the one who unites them. If you separate you, destroy everything. This marriage covenant is expressed in a one flesh union. The two will become one flesh. Jesus concludes this in verse 6a. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. This is the most a profound, powerful expression of the marriage union of the two people. Usually, one plus one equals two, yeah. <laughs> Good at math. <laughs> but uh, in marriage, one plus one equals one, yeah. This is nonsense from an arithmetical point of view. But in marriage, they are united in a mysterious way that belongs to no other human relationship. There is an intimate sharing of a body, soul, and spirit in marriage. It's much, much more than a sexual union. It is about unselfish love that gives itself sacrificially. The husband gives himself to his wife sacrificially, and the wife gives herself to her husband sacrificially. Number three, marriage is a covenant relationship intended to be permanent and unbreakable. Permanent and unbreakable. Marriage is not intended to be eternal beyond this life. In heaven, there is no marriage, okay? <laughs> But it is, marriage is a lifetime commitment. Jesus pronounced this in verse 6b, saying, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. The marriage covenant is sacred. It is God witnessed irrevocable relationship between a man and woman. This means that marriage is a one-way street without U-turns. There is no U-turns. There is a no turning back. The Bible often uses the imagery of marriage to describe uh, God's everlasting love to his people. For example, in Hosea, God says in Hosea 2.19, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. The marriage relationship should reflect this covenant of God that is faithful and permanent. It is a representation of Christ's love relationship to his church. So the meaning of marriage is much deeper than mere social convention. Jesus declared, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Every couple who married hear these words. Now, all that Bible teaches about marriage is in direct opposition to today's dominant view of marriage. Tim Keller calls it me marriage me marriage, which sees marriage as a way to reach personal life goals. Both men and women, uh, women are all look for a marriage partner who will fulfill their emotional, sexual, and spiritual desires. People want too much out of marriage, putting a crushing burden of expectations on their spouses. But the reality is that uh, in marriage, Two flawed people come together. Two sinners come together. That's the reality. <laughs> In the beginning of my marriage, I believed I married an angel or a saint who was so considerate of others and devoted to the Lord. I believed so. 
God gave me the Christian name Augustine from Saint Augustine. And my wife received the name Monica from Saint Monica, uh, who prayed patiently and sacrificially for a troublemaker son Augustine. I thought that I was much better than a troublemaker, but it turned out that I was wrong. It didn't take long, it didn't take me long uh, to see the reality of how selfish and stubborn I am and was. My wife wasn't an angel either. <laughs> In the beginning, uh, we ar argued and hurt each other often. We fought each other, that's reality. But uh, finally, by God's grace, we could come to a sober realization. I am a sinner, you are a sinner too. <laughs> we are both flawed and imperfect, so what? Even when we are imperfect, God's love never fails. So we agreed, let's have mercy on each other. After that, I began to experience Christ's profound love and mercy in my family life. In my Christ-centered marriage, a big change happened in me. For example, it might be small, but uh, before my marriage, I was self-conscious of my curly hair, my curly hair. But because my wife really liked it, I loved it too. Since she said, uh, I'm handsome, I believe I'm handsome, <laughs> even though you may think, uh, see it differently. <laughs> this is a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. I'm grateful to God for his transforming love from the bottom of my heart. Praise Jesus. When Jesus taught that divorce is absolutely wrong, the Pharisees asked in verse 7, Why then did Moses command a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? During that time, divorce was a largely divided topic among people. In the rabbinic interpretation of Deuteronomy 24, 1, the school of Shammai saw divorce as morally acceptable only in cases of adultery. Yet, the school of Hillel interpreted it more liberally. A woman could be divorced even if she spoiled a dish for her husband or if she failed to measure up to the beauty of the rival. Wow, it's too much. <laughs> Influenced by the liberal interpretation, the society took a divorce lightly. What was Jesus' answer? Look at verse 8. Can you read this verse together? Let's go. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Here, Jesus corrected the Pharisees' misinterpretation. Moses permitted the divorce, but did not command it. Jesus pointed out their real problem, which was their heart and hearts. In other words, the real problem is our self-centered and unrepentant hearts. The intention of Old Testament laws was to protect abandoned women who were victims of divorce in a patriarchal society. But in the beginning of creation, devotion was no option at all. In verse 9, Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. There are controversial issues regarding how to understand the exception clause of sexual immorality. But if we pay undue attention to this, we'll ask the same legalistic questions of the Pharisees when divorce is permissible. 
then we'll miss Jesus' point that God is really deeply saddened by divorce. We live uh, in a culture in which uh, adultery, divorce, and remarriage are prevalent. Divorce wounds people deeply, both partners and children. According to a survey, the top three reasons for divorce are lack of commitment, excessive arguments, and infidelity. Our sin causes broken relationships and disfigures the image of God in marriage. So many young people are skeptical about true love and afraid of commitment. The truth is that People are powerless to change themselves. That's a reality. But Jesus, Jesus can recreate us to be his kingdom people. Now, Jesus expects that our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. How is this possible? It is possible because of the grace of Jesus. He remains faithful even when you are unfaithful, even when you have lived like an adulterous bride, he doesn't give up on us, but pursues us and brings us back by the blood of Jesus. If you struggle with your marriage, if you struggle with your marriage, you should never ask how you can get out of the commitments you made. If you have wounds of divorce, I believe that Jesus is your compassionate healer. He's a healer. All of us have the King, King Jesus, who offers his grace of forgiveness and new beginning and strength. When we put him, when we put Jesus at the center of our marriage, we can live out the marriage commitment, our marriage vows. May his grace and his spirit transform our hearts and marriages. Amen. Amen. Now, how did the disciples respond to Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce? Look at verse 10. If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. <laughs> wow. Well, quite a number of people agree. <laughs> the disciples lived in a society where divorces were practiced liberally. But Jesus destroyed the popular grounds for divorce. Now, the question arises, what? If I marry the wrong person, should I suffer a lifelong unhappy marriage? Would it be better not to marry at all than to risk such a demanding commitment? But Jesus said, not everyone can accept it, this word, but only those to whom it has been given. This word refers to the statement not to marry. Jesus said in verse 12 that what they said applies only to eunuchs. You know who are eunuchs? They, are, they don't have parts working for marriage. <laughs> they are born, deformed, or made so by humans in ancient times to serve in a royal court. These two groups of celibate men were known to the disciples. But Jesus mentions a third group in verse 12b. They are, they are those, there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. These are people who choose to refrain from marriage for the sake of the kingdom. Historically, a metaphor of eunuchs was offensive to Jewish society 
because they were not allowed in the assembly of the Lord. Moreover, it was thought that everyone should marry for the sake of family and society. But by using such a shameful metaphor, Jesus teaches about the supreme value of the kingdom of God that surpasses all human value. Here is Jesus, is Jesus saying that uh, singleness is holier than marriage? No. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God has the highest value, not self-fulfillment or social status. Some receive a call to celibacy for the sake of God, for the sake of the kingdom of God. It is also a beautiful thing when it is accepted by faith and followed gladly. For example, the Apostle Paul, uh, he lived as a, a single to serve God's ministry throughout his whole life. Now, singleness is not a plan B for our Christian lives. We should not build our hope on marriage or our family. To marry or not to marry is not the ultimate question. It is all about the kingdom of God, whether we marry or not. What can truly satisfy our souls? Can marriage fill the void in our souls? What do you think? No, yeah. Jesus, yes. Even the best marriage cannot fill the void in our hearts. Only Jesus, God's perfect love, can fulfill the deep desire of our souls. When we develop a fulfilling love relationship with Jesus, our Savior, our lives, married or single, are truly fulfilling. Amen. Look at verse 13. Then people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Children were second-class citizens in ancient society. Disciples thought they are also second-class in the kingdom. But how did Jesus respond? Look at verse 14. Can you read this verse together? Let's go. Let the little children come to me. Thank you. Jesus rebuked his disciples. It's because they did not want uh, their teacher interrupted by such low status people like children. They didn't understand what Jesus' kingdom is really about, caring for the little ones. If we follow wrong concept of the kingdom, we'll see children as interruption to our mission. But, but Jesus welcomed the little children and blessed them. It is parents' responsibility to bring their children to Jesus and not hinder them because of our commitment to mission. In this aspect, I really appreciate the children ministry in our church. The kingdom of God belongs to those who come to Jesus with humility and trust. In our times, the devil makes his most strategic attack on family through adultery, divorce, and same-sex marriage. But Christ Church is a countercultural kingdom movement that displays the power and beauty of the gospel. A church in which marriages and families are healthy and strong can most effectively advance the kingdom of God. But because of busy work and ministry, 
we have a tendency to take our spouses, spouses for granted and to become demanding at home. This also affects our family dynamics. When parents argue with each other, children suffer a lot. They feel true happiness when their parents love each other, according to my uh, children. <laughs> this requires, this requires us to rearrange our value system. We have to recover a kingdom-centered view of marriage and family. When we stress the importance of family, we are not saying that we should, we should be family-focused. No, family is not the ultimate goal, but a pointer to the kingdom of heaven. A healthy community is neither family-focused nor ministry-centered but kingdom-centered and Jesus-focused, then ministry and family will naturally follow. How can it be such a church? We must reorient our vision away from self-centeredness toward the kingdom. <clears throat> when we put Jesus, the king, at the center of our lives, the beauty of the kingdom of God will be displayed through our lives. What does a kingdom-centered view of marriage mean to us practically? Martin Luther declared that marriage is a, a school for character. You know what that means? School for character? I love this word. People dream of, me, dream of meeting the right person to marry. But an ethics professor said, we always marry the wrong person. <laughs> this is the truth. There is no perfect right person because of our self-centeredness. The single should know this. <laughs> our self-centeredness is the great sin that blinds us and makes us hurt, hurt each other. When you are self-centered, Self-centered, you don't see yourself. You see only others. How others make a, a mistake. That's self-centeredness. The more, you know, between a wife, a wife and a husband. Wives are hurt by their husband's uh, self-centeredness, while husbands are hurt by their wives' self-centeredness. The more intimate the relationship, the deeper the wounds. Now, what is the point of marriage if we hurt each other? The marriage exists for you to work on your self-centeredness. That's the meaning of marriage, to work on our self-centeredness, not for our self-fulfillment. Marriage is the perfect place for that. If both spouses are willing to get the self out of the center, marriage can be taken to a new level of love and fulfillment beyond what it could have ever imagined. Children, you know, how can we do this? How can we, how can we take our self out of the center? by simply trusting Jesus like little children. Children are different from the Pharisees who were proud, legalistic, and stubborn. They are quick to trust, forgive, and reconcile. What we need is to trust Jesus' sacrificial love and forgiveness. As we, like little children, trust in his grace, will experience the kingdom of God Amen. So, in view of the kingdom, let's examine our hearts. Does your marriage reflect the covenant love of our humble Savior who died in our place? Is your family ruled by the risen King who gives us life? 
It's your singleness ruled by a love relationship with your Savior. May we come to Jesus and trust in his sacrificial love. I believe that when we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, we can love and forgive each other as Jesus loves us and forgives us. May God bring our families healing and strength in the Lord, in our Lord Jesus to display the glory and image of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love, your covenant love that we can experience, receive through Jesus. Lord, I ask uh, your blessing and mercy. Please uh, help us to remember your grace and love and uh, live out your beautiful love in our families, Lord, in our marriages. Please send a revival to this nation. In Jesus' name I, in Jesus name I pray, amen. amen.